In our last video, we talked about uh, ways to synthesize alkynes from other alkynes, particularly by alkylating terminal alkynes. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about another way to synthesize alkynes. Uh, and this way is particularly valuable if you don't already have an alkyne molecule laying around. Uh, so what happens if we wanted to synthesize uh, this compound here, which is one heptine, uh, uh, I'm sorry, one hexine, but we don't have an alkyne laying around. Fortunately, uh, we can synthesize this alkyne by a, an elimination reaction using a molecule that has two leaving groups. Actually, let's be let's be generic. Uh, let's put X in here as generic halide leaving groups. And we use the phrase excess base. Right. You'll, ex you'll forgive me uh, for writing, uh, for abbreviating the, the word excess with the abbreviation XS. Uh, the two letters X and S together sound like the word excess. Uh, you, if you haven't already figured it out, organic chemists uh, and scientists in general like abbreviations. Uh, and so this abbreviation helps us save just a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. We're using excess space uh, for a couple of reasons, but we just generally use the word excess when we want to make sure that we have uh, enough base to do everything we want that base to do. Uh, this is... Uh, This is in, in contrast to specifying, uh, say, instead of excess, um, one equivalent of base, where uh, that abbreviation equivalent means, or EQ means equivalent. Um, you know, an equivalent means that if I have one mole of substrate, I have one mole of base. If I have 0.5 moles of substrate, I have 0.5 moles of base. If I have 153 billion moles of substrate, I have 153 billion moles of base. Terrifyingly large number. Um, but if I only have one equivalent of base, I can only do one elimination reaction, and so we would get a different... We would get a different product out of this reaction. We would get... Uh, just a single alkene. And so even though I haven't told you how this reaction works, you may have already started to be suspicious that um, what we're going to be talking about is uh, E2 elimination reactions. Oh, let's, let's make that bigger. There we go. E2 elimination reactions. When you first studied the elimination reactions, you know you had halide leaving groups or other leaving groups and a suitably strong base, you get an alkene. Well, if you have two leaving groups, you might expect to get two pi bonds out of the, the reaction process. One leaving group, one pi bond. Two leaving groups, two pi bonds. Uh, on the next slide, we're going to talk our, about uh, our choice of base. Uh, turns out that base matters. When you first uh, started talking about E2 elimination reactions, we were using alkoxide, hydroxide, things that are by all rights strong bases in the general chemistry sense of the word. And these bases are uh, strong enough to do a single E2 reaction. But they are not strong enough to do the second one. Make 
sure I'm drawing the same molecule. Here we go. Now that we have this alkene that needs to be deprotonated for the second E2, uh, the alkoxide anion is just not going to be a strong enough base. So we need a stronger base. Well, we have a stronger base. In fact, we, we have talked about this stronger base before. Here is sodium amide. Sodium amide is a strong enough base to do one deprotonation, one E2 elimination, and the second one on the alkene. Now you'll notice on this slide, I have as a second step uh, water. It turns out that this reaction needs to be neutralized or, or uh, in the, the phrasing of, of, in, of the lab, have an aqueous workup. Uh, and that means that we need to add water or some other aqueous solution in order to help us isolate the desired product. Aqueous workups are needed when the reagents that do the active transformation don't yield the desired product in neutral form. That means we need to add something that can neutralize that reaction. Uh, when I show you the mechanism, you'll understand what I mean by that. So let's actually show the mechanism of the reaction that we just looked at. Uh, our first step is going to be an E2 elimination. Uh, here, you know what, let's just copy and paste our molecule. Uh, you know what, I have two leaving groups. I have two hydrogens. I could do the E2 elimination at either spot. Uh, I'm actually going to pick the internal one. It turns out it probably doesn't matter. Um, but I'm going to pick it. Oh, and I'm going to remember to put in some lone pairs. You do not need to remember the lone pairs on your nucleophiles, but it's helpful uh, drawing them in because that helps you remember that, in fact, they are nucleophiles. Nucleophiles are things that have lone pairs. Right? And the, the E2 elimination reaction is, nucleof or is proton transfer, uh, forming the pi bond, and loss of leaving group all uh, together. And the outcome of that reaction step is this uh, two bromo one butene. The second step of this reaction is also an E2 elimination. Now, because we're doing the elimination across an alkene, this is where it's absolutely critical that we have a stronger base. Uh, there are two hydrogens here. Um, if you remember from, if you remember from uh, your initial studies of E2 type elimination, you remember that you need to have a coplanar or periplanar geometry for the E2 elimination to occur. Uh, on the alkyl halide, that means that the hydrogen and the, the bromine or the leaving group need to be anti. But in alkene, everything's planar. So actually, either of the two hydrogens here could be removed by our NH2 minus, but uh, I sort of have an aesthetic preference for the anti one. It's kind of your choice, really. And that forms the, the second pi bond uh, across the carbon-carbon bond. And you might be thinking to yourself, yes, we're done. The product that we ha wanted is uh, right there. Here is our desired product. Here's what the product is. Uh, unfortunately, this mechanism does not account for the need to add water. It also does not account for... Uh, 
a reality that occurs in this kind of reaction. I hope you remember from uh, a previous video, something weird is going on here. Uh, so I hope you remember from a previous video, uh, terminal alkynes are acidic uh, and the types of bases that we use to, to deprotonate terminal alkynes are NaNH2 or uh, sodium amine. And if you remember from up here in our reaction, we started with excess sodium amides. So that means there's still plenty left over now that it's done its E2 work to deprotonate the alkyne. Uh, and thermodynamically, right, the, this, is, this is hard to stop. The equilibrium constant of this acid-base reaction is really quite large. And thus, the There we go. The equilibrium constant, the equilibrium constant of this is really quite large, and so it's almost impossible to stop. Uh, K here equals ten to the thirteen. All right, so that means out of every. Uh, 10 trillion alkynes, only one is protonated under these kinds of conditions. It's kind of what this, this equilibrium constant means. This proton transfer cannot be pre prevented under these conditions. And it is, as I said uh, on the previous screen, this is why we have an aqueous workup. The product that we want does not form as it, the neutral molecule. After all of the sodium amide has done everything it's going to do, we don't have the, the alkyne. We have acetylide anion. We don't want the acetylide anion. We want the alkyne. And so we want to provide some kind of acid that will protonate the acetylide anion and make the alkyne. Uh, and it turns out that we really just want to use about the weakest acid that we can get away with uh, in case there are other unforeseen acid-based kind of consequences. So oh, water with its pKa of 15.7 is a good choice. Uh, there are in fact other uh, acids that are weaker than water, but we use water as a relatively, uh, water is relatively common, low toxicity and expensive, all of those things. Let me just zoom out here a little bit so you can get a sense of the whole mechanism. I know it's pretty small, it's smaller now, but here you go. E2 elimination, E2 elimination, proton transfer to form the acetylide anion, proton transfer, and the aqueous workup. Now, uh, let's quickly talk about one limitation of this reaction. I'm going to spend more time on this limitation in a separate video, but I wanted to get you... Uh, uh, just get you thinking about it. Here is an example uh, where our, our substrate has two leaving groups on the same carbon. That's okay. Uh, but it's inside the molecule. And like cases with the elimination of one leaving group to make alkenes, there's two possible products that can form here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
look, I'm, I am I need to count car, my carbons to make sure I didn't make a mistake, just like you did. Just like you do. Uh, and so we can get elimination in either direction to make 2 hexine or 3 hexine. Actually, uh, this, this is this is uh, this situation is even trickier. Internal alkynes I summarize under the conditions of reactions. What, is, what does that even mean? Uh, it means that both of these internal alkynes will eventually uh, I summarize to uh, the terminal alkyne. And I have a whole video explaining how this happens, so sit tight. And the major product of the reaction is not 2 hexine or 3 hexine, but 1 hexine, even though the leaving group is where our leaving groups are in the middle. Uh, so there, this process is really good for making uh, terminal alkynes. It's a little trickier for internal alkynes. I'm not saying you can't maybe get some of these molecules out, but you know, the yield's not going to be high. Uh, let's finish off with two examples. Uh, our first example what is the product of the reaction of 1,1-dibromo-3-methylbutane with excess sodium amide followed by aqueous workup? So here I have a molecule, two leaving groups. I know the examples I did earlier had the two leaving groups on, the, on neighboring carbons. This reaction works just as well uh, if the two leaving groups are on the same carbon. So... After our first E2 reaction, we have a molecule that has the alkene here, because this is, this is where uh, our hydrogens that can be removed are, and one leaving group left. So now we can do, after the second elimination, we will get the alkyne at that spot. Uh, and there we go. Uh, of course, after aqueous workup. In our second example problem, I want to synthesize uh, one hexine from one hexene. We know uh, from the earlier parts of this video that if we want to make this uh, terminal alkyne, we, we want a molecule that has some leaving groups ready to go. Uh, for, for our double E2 kind of delimination. So excess NH2, uh, actually one, and two H2O. But uh, I'm gonna trick this so it's not trying to do goofy things. And so then the real question is, can we synthesize this molecule here uh, from the alkene? And perhaps you remember that the principal type of reaction that alkenes undergo are addition reactions. And there is, in fact, a way to add two halogen atoms across the, the alkene bond. And that is actually simply by reacting with uh, a molecule of the appropriate halogen. This synthesis would have worked equally well if we'd have chosen bromine instead of chlorine. We couldn't have chosen iodine because the iodine reaction with, with alkene is not productive. But at least chlorine and bromine make a molecule with two leaving groups, do the double elimination. In the next video, uh, I'll briefly explain the isomeration of alkynes. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap up this chunk on the synthesis of alkynes by just briefly showing examples of other more recent developments in the synthesis of alkynes. Thank you for watching.